Welcome back. We are here at the Adobe 99U conference in New York City. That's why our studio looks a little bit different than it usually does. Uh, I'm Kathleen and this is Jeannie Huang. Welcome Jeannie. She has streamed with us before on Adobe Live and we'll be jumping into her work very soon. But before that, I want to pop up the schedule, let you all know what's going to be happening uh, today. We're just going to be chatting for a couple minutes, and then we're going to go over to Scott Belsky's speech and talk when he starts there. So stick around, make sure you're around all day, and Jeannie, maybe you can introduce yourself. Yeah. So thank you so much for having me. Um, I love being on Adobe Live. This is my second time. And I am a senior product designer, and I actually happen to work on Behance. So thank you for everyone who's watching on Behance right now. Yeah. Um, B.net slash live. It really means a lot to our team. Our team is super small, um, especially our design team. And we love Behance and the community and the ways which you guys are so committed to things like live or to uploading your projects. Um, it means a lot to us. So. Us too. Yes. Yeah, so if you're watching from YouTube, yeah. come on over to be.net slash live, best place to watch. Yeah. Cool. So yeah, and I think everyone in chat would say they also appreciate the community. So thanks everyone for being here. Really appreciate it. Cool. And everyone say hi to Jeannie. People are saying hi. What's up, Axel? Hi, Anita, Simon, Lindsay, all familiar faces. Super cool. Actually, quick anecdote. We met one of the Adobe Live viewers yesterday, Jamie Hernandez. Super cool. Wow. Yeah, it's really awesome. Awesome, so what are you gonna be showing us today? All right. So every year we try to compile together a year in review and mm. um, last year for 2017 we did a really big one and you know this conference means is a big deal for us right now, the 99U and also Behance because it's our 10 year anniversary. Yes. Decade old. It's a decade old. So um, I've been to about four or five of these but there's been 10 years of total history um, and Scott, who's going to take the stage in about a few minutes, he's actually the original co-founder um, and CEO of Behance before it was acquired by Adobe. Um, and Scott is currently also a VP at Adobe. Uh, it's, it's just really exciting to kind of see the progression that Behance has gone through and the ways that community has really changed over time, always for the better. Um, so I'd love to show you the year in review that we made for 2017 because I think it's a great way to showcase what are creatives doing? How is Behance impacting people's lives? You know, where are you guys really looking um, to grow and learn? Um, so the link is going to be in the chat. It's behance.net slash year in review. Cool. Um, and you can see here, it's kind of just got these like beautiful animations. And this wow. is all work from Behance. Mm -hmm. um, you can see like if you click through, they'll open different projects made by those people. Right. Um, and really, the key that we were always interested in was to show, showcase like what what happened over these ten years. Um, and so, like, there'll be things like showing you like what Behance used to look like Whoa. in 2000, and I don't remember uh, 2007. Um, it was really old. It was orange back then. Mm. Um, Not the Adobe. This Red. is actually a video from 99U from last year. Um, so we had a Adobe Live presence then, um, mm -hmm. and we're super happy to see that. You know, the print magazine has been taking off, really. There's Michael. Yep, there's Michael. <laughs> um, and um, Scott shows up here, too. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a great homage to kind of the people who have helped and worked on this over time. Heck yeah. Um, so yeah, I highly recommend scrolling through this. I think it's just really, really beautiful. Um, the team that worked on this was super small, and I'm really proud of all the work that we do. Um, so yeah. Uh, Beautiful. Would you guys like to see anything specific about the page? Chat, are you interested? Anything specific? What, what does it have to offer? I see there's lots of uh, anecdotes kind of showing the, the people who created these things. What's your favorite part? Yeah, so one of my favorite parts is honestly that um, beyond these stats, there's actually these great user stories. Um, mm -hmm. And so uh, every year we email people on the network and we say, you know, what are you interested in? What are you, what are you excited about? Um, what, how has Behance impacted your life? And this is just some great user stories. This one's by Matt. It says, in 2007, I went out on my own and became a self-employed freelancer. Um, it was posting my work to Behance that eventually paid off. Um, and I think that's just such a great story. Um, you know, we, you can see more of his work when you hover over these. Yeah, that's really cool. I have my own Behance story. I'm 99% sure that I found my internship at Adobe on the Behance job boards. Wow, that's amazing. Look where I am now. <laughs> Thanks, Behance. Yeah, so for sure, if you are interested in seeing, like, you know, if you haven't used Behance before, or you've always hesitated, like, why should I upload my projects here? Or, like, what is the 
purpose of having a creative community if you know I'm a newcomer or someone who is you know just starting on my career yeah. um, I think these are great there's just like lots of small anecdotes about what this would mean for people yeah and I think something that's really special about Behance is that there's no gateway that you have to pass through to start uploading. You can be a beginner, you can be a copyist. We had a bunch of beginners using Illustrator uploading to Behance a couple weeks ago. You don't have to be a professional. Yeah. And you can become a professional by posting yep. on Behance. And asking for feedback is amazing yes. on Behance. You know, we're always introducing new ways to improve our comments, new ways to think about why people should upload work, um, new formats. You know, we're yep. playing with like should you be able to upload a video or audio file? Like, yes, right. you can. Yeah. Because we want to encompass people who do sound design mm -hmm. and people who are doing motion graphics. Yeah. So. I've seen that, some cool embedding of like video players and projects. Yeah. It's awesome. Um, so one question I see on there is, what is the meaning behind 99U? Uh, yes, the infamous question. Nobody knows the answer. <laughs> yeah. And so originally 99U started out as a 99% conference, and mm -hmm. that was about genius being 1% um, inspiration, 99% perspiration, um, and now we've made it really about learning and specifically geared towards the creative community. Right. Um, and I think that's really where if you are interested in learning specifically, how can I write a great resume? How can I upload a portfolio that people will notice? Mm -hmm. um, the places to really do that are on 99u.com. They write articles every week um, specifically geared towards creatives, and they also do great interviews of um, creatives that are doing work across different countries, across different spectrums. Um, one of my favorite recent interviews is this woman who does pottery in Japan, and she actually owns a studio there that has been there for decades and just over, it's been in her family for a long right, time. Right. Um, so I love reading about stuff like that and seeing, you know, I might not do pottery professionally or ceramics, but getting to experience how other creatives are engaging in their craft yeah. is very, very good. Yeah, Simon says 99U on Apple TV is pretty cool. Yeah, that that's cool. awesome. Nice. Um, since we have a little bit of time, I'd love to kind of walk you guys through, you know, what process of designing some, a page like this would be. Yeah. So this is a one-off project that our team would, you know, we don't typically make giant pages with videos and photos. Um, really what we're, we do is we design the UI behind Behance. Like, what should the Discover page look like? Or what should your profile and your profile edit or account settings look like? Um, so this is kind of a one-off project, but we always use Adobe XD. Um, yeah. Yeah, Chad, if you don't know what Adobe XD is, super awesome uh, prototyping app, really fast. You know much more about it than I do, so I'll let you talk about it. <laughs> no, no, you, you nailed it. Yeah. Um, and we love using it for UI UX design. Um, you know, here you can see kind of like all the screens that I've made for this particular project, and I like to have a little section at the bottom that actually saves all of my archive screen. So here's like templates that don't necessarily have real content, but were like me testing out different things, um, or like archives of like you know ones that I discarded or things that I thought would work, but then ultimately didn't you know fit the bill of what we needed to make. And then here at the top is a final of what I would deliver to a developer. And so my development team at Behance is super tight-knit. They're very, very good at what they do. Mm -hmm. And they kind of get these XD screens, and they look at it, and we talk about, you know, what are the constraints on this? Are there any tech constraints? Um, are there timing constraints? Uh, what does it mean to load a giant video? There's like lots of, yeah. lots of questions I have to answer. Yeah, Jean Joel says, what? That's really cool. Yeah, this is kind of a mind-blowing app. Yeah. You've never played with it. Also, a lot of cool developers behind Adobe Live. Yes. Over at Behance. So, thanks, y'all. Yes. <laughs> um, and here you can see kind of like a template for what a tablet or mobile version would look like. And I, we always Ooh. design responsibly. Um, and I think that's super important that if you go to the mobile web, you know, you're on your phone, you can still browse this site. And it should animate pretty well. Mm -hmm. Cool. What's the difference there? Like, I'm sure there's a lot of differences, but is there one key thing, like just making things more seamless, maybe a little more simpler? Yeah, so the big thing that we've noticed is when you're designing responsibly, we actually have to account for people's internet speed being a lot slower, right? Uh -oh. So yeah. you're not trying to render an entire video. Like on the web right now, these videos are, let me see if I can pull it up. These videos at the top, they're like enormous and beautiful, mm -hmm. like, but on a desktop computer, that makes total sense, but on a phone, you might not want to rent, like the page will probably just crash. Yeah. 
um, where all your data goes bye bye exactly <laughs> um, and so here we've actually replaced those videos with static images in preparation for users who are browsing it on an iPad at work or like on a commute or like on their phone in a coffee shop where you, we know that you might have limited internet and you know there's a reason for us to kind of cap that size yeah definitely uh, yeah. Liam says, ironically, in Australia, mobile speeds are faster than desktop speeds. I've heard that, actually. What hap What's happening? Liam, um, are you okay over there? Are you on your phone? <laughs> um, it really depends because on in specific countries, we also try to optimize for, you know, not just us, but like lots mm -hmm. of big companies try to optimize for countries where the internet might be slower or they might have a specific size, um, like where netbooks might be really popular as opposed to a 13 inch computer. Right. So responsive design helps us kind of account for those things. And say, <coughs> sorry. And say like, what will it look like on a netbook in say India? And okay. also what it looks like on a Android in China. Mm -hmm. um, and just kind of like thinking about all those different use cases and testing them. Yeah, that is super responsive. Crazy. Yeah. Liam says it's only five megabytes per second. Wow. Yeah. Good luck, Liam. Good so, luck out there. <laughs> so Anita says, ask me if I code. And I think that's a really common ah. question we get at Behance. Mm -hmm. um, since the designers are such a small team, there's only six of us total um, in, at Behance who yeah. work on design. Um, and so we have the ability to code, but we often don't actually execute our work in code. Wow. Um, because our, it's actually not, it's a testament to how fast my development team is. So the head of front end development, Jackie Balzer, is actually one of the devs who got to work on this, along with Jesse Lee. Mm -hmm. um, and the two of them got, you know, put this together, this page together for me really, really quickly. Yeah. And I could probably try to like tweak things in the browser or attempt to code it myself, but right. frankly, nobody really wants me to do that because it's a waste of time. Yeah, um, they're like, let me just do it. <laughs> yeah, and they can do it so much faster. So a lot of times we try to design and iterate quickly with a developer um, hand in hand, kind of like sitting next to each other and working together. Right, So, but you are kind of a unicorn. You can code and you can design. Can code is... is you're very small is a unicorn. Is a, is a stretch, I would say. That's interesting. And I'm interested in the other kinds of designers on the team. Is it only UI UX designers? Is it maybe more some graphics or visual design as well? Yeah, so all of the graphics that are at 99U from the booklet to, you know, the there's like displays around the conference yeah. or even the graphics that you see between each session, mm -hmm. um, those are actually made by Mark Brooks, who is the creative director at 99U. Cool. So he's someone who focused exclusively on branding, yeah. print, identity design mm -hmm. for Behance and at 99U, so he's on our team. Um, then there are four of us who are desktop UI UX designers, or it's not desktop, but we're thinking more about like um, our computers and then uh, responsive like mobile web. Yeah. And then right. we have one, one more designer who works exclusively on apps. So he works on the iPhone and Android apps. Oh. Cool. Yep. So a lot of different types of designers, but all working towards the same goal. Yeah. Really cool. And Behance has always worked that way. I think, you know, part of the amazing part of working at Behance is that you're a really small team, so you get to iterate really quickly, you get to move fast. Um, and so we've always had designers who, you know, multitask across different things. So sometimes, you know, my coworker Kathy, who is a pro uh, like a product or UI UX designer, and she's well, awesome. She's very awesome. <laughs> um, she'll dabble in like making a designing a postcard mm -hmm. or like helping out with a specific banner for mm -hmm. a print. Um, and we can also move across different platforms. Mm -hmm. And I think that kind of fluidity helps us keep us on our toes because you realize you're like you go back to doing app work and you're like wow, I know nothing about mm -hmm. iPhone, like iOS standards anymore. Like it's changed so much since, it's you so know, fast. six months ago when I touched something or yeah. a year ago. Yeah, especially Android. It's like boom, 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 boom. Yeah, crazy. For sure. Yeah, and um, Joseph says, interesting to hear all of this. If you have any other questions for Jeannie, please feel free to ask. It's not often that we have an actual product designer at Behance with us, so please feel free to ask. But it looks like we have a couple more minutes. Will is not on stage yet, so maybe we can look a little bit more at this project or at the um, year in review. Yeah. Year in review. 
So here, um, you can kind of see also what we'll do is sometimes we won't prototype fully with an animation. Um, that's one way to do it is definitely to open up something like Figma or, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's lots of <clears throat> apps out there, even, even in XC where you could open the prototype link uh, up here and try to prototype the individual, you know, click throughs and what that yes. would look like. Right. Um, we actually don't do that a lot because in this case, this is such a um, fluid page that it's not about clicks it's really about like what the page how it would scroll yeah. and how it would bounce mm -hmm. so what we'll do sometimes we'll like do something like this where we're just showing a couple of different states of what things would look like I'll just scroll down exactly gotcha. or we'll show something like here's like the hover state for that 2007 mm -hmm. page that you saw so like we'll just kind of show what it should look like right um, and I think really what we're looking at is to be able to work quickly with the development team and say when it comes to animation can we like show it mm -hmm. um, and like work together with the dev quickly to say like he, like I wanted to fade in that 0.5 seconds yes I wanted to have this specific animation mm -hmm. um, style or pacing right yeah that's really cool somebody said really cool to see all this behind the scenes stuff at Adobe oh yeah that was Liam what's up Jan Eric in the chat good morning good morning uh, so Richard is wondering, is it possible to add a slideshow to your Behance page, and what's the best way to do it? So the best way to do a slideshow is actually to use our Lightbox feature. Yep. Um, and it's not ex not as obviously a slideshow mm -hmm. as... Not what you might automatically think of. Yeah. So what I like to do is I like to take something that is a grid of images already mm -hmm. and kind of click through. So you can kind of actually select in, and like when you select into the the image, mm -hmm. it opens a light box, and you can actually left, right through the images right. um, by clicking the left, right arrow buttons, mm -hmm. and that's a great way to browse something if you want to browse through like a bunch of images. Um, so. Yeah, and you can see little hints, like you can see the very faint little white arrows in the left and right kind of giving you hints. Yep. Um, very cool. That's, an, a, that's a great project. Yeah, these are great. Um, these are all projects that are featured on the as our best of Behance mm. on the Discover page. So when you hit Behance.net, um, when you're logged out, this is like the first thing that you see. And all of these are curated by our amazing curation team. Ooh, um, there's an in-house curation team. There is an in-house curation team. That's and that's like a, some, a big question that we get asked a lot is like, how do I get featured? You know, what does right. it mean to be on the front page of Behance? Like, yeah. how do I get there? Um, and our curation team is a small team mm -hmm. that actually looks at all of the projects that come through Behance. And they kind of moderate them maybe, or just, yeah. Um, the moderation is a separate team, but gotcha. the curation part is really interesting because they actually look at it and they're thinking not just about like is this project should it be featured mm -hmm. <clears throat> but also like should does it do these projects kind of cover a span of different types of um, creative fields yeah. in, internally in those creative fields there's like sub fields so for totally. example if you go to a curated gallery oh interesting it's not just graphic design but if you click through the graphic design we can actually break it down by exhibition and signage, which wow. is so specific. Yeah, really drilling down. Right, or infographic, which is, you know, so different from mm -hmm. just um, print branding. Yeah, I've been looking for like icon sets on Behance, and I can definitely drill down just to specifically icon sets within graphic design. Yeah. Super cool. Um, one, some of my favorites are in illustration. I think, you know, sp splitting it out to digital art, or even my favorite is street art, is oh, cool. just an amazing way to kind of browse, mm -hmm. you know, what this looks like. Yeah, that's really, I think Behance is a great place to get inspired. Yep. I'm always scrolling, feeling a little bad about myself because it's very, very good art, but it's also inspiring. Yeah, for sure. So cool. Ashot says, come in. Yes, if you hear the doorbell ringing, <laughs> so do we. <laughs> uh, any other questions? What's up? Shauna Lynn is in the chat. Uh, Liam is wondering, any plans to add more responsive ways of editing? Well, that might be more of an XD question. I think that's something the XD team is definitely thinking about. Yeah. Um, the XD team in particular, I really enjoy working with them. I've met mm -hmm. them a handful of times, and they are phenomenal. They are so responsive to feedback. Um, anytime you ask questions in the Adobe forums, or like sometimes they'll post into uh, designer news, they'll say like, hey, here's like, um, a feature that we're pushing, is there any requests or any bugs that you've noticed yeah. that people will actually write, <laughs> write in and the XD team will actually personally respond. Like right. a designer from XD will be like, mm -hmm. okay, yeah, well, we're thinking about that and here's like a workaround or like, wow, we've never considered that. Like, can you tell us more? Mm -hmm. So I highly recommend, <clears throat> sorry, talking to them. 
but yeah. they definitely are thinking about responsive design. It's a huge part of what we do as UI UX designers. Um, it has to, it just has to be considered. Um, mm -hmm. And so for now, they're just uh, Liam is right. We just typically split it out into separate screens. For those who haven't seen it yet, I'm just splitting it out like this on the side into tablet and mobile. Oh, cool. Nice. Yep. Breaking it out that way. And if chat that you haven't ever experienced XD, experienced, uh, even if you have no interest in, like, interest in prototyping or uh, mobile design or web design, anything like that, it's still great to just get in this program that the devs are so interested in hearing your feedback because you might have fresh eyes and say something that they've never thought about. For and sure. You might change the direction of an Adobe app. Yeah. Super cool. I think, especially with new Adobe products like um, that, you know, they're they're open to experimenting. They're open to thinking about, you know, what should this look like for a mobile app, or what should it look like um, for someone who's on the go and doesn't have internet access. Or, you know, they're they're very open, and there's like a lot of flexibility there to prioritize that. Gotcha. And it looks like Will is on the stage. That means Scott Belsky will be coming up soon. So we're just going to be with you for maybe another couple minutes. So we might have to leave in a hurry, yep. but I think it was maybe Tina was wondering, is there a way to send feedback to the Behance team? Yeah, for sure. So on Twitter, if you look at, if you mention at Behance, a team member sits, who literally sits next to me, actually looks at every single one of our community support, right. you know, conversations. We're, I love our community support team. They sit right next to development and right next to design, and they answer all the tickets. Any ticket time you've ever written anything in to say, hey, this is a bug, or I, I, I don't know how to do this. Mm -hmm. And a real person who sits with me is like, yes, let me help you. Yeah. Um, so it's they're real. always, they field all the questions, and you can always either tweet at them or on our Facebook, leave a comment. Mm -hmm. um, and you can you can mention, like, you know, I spoke on, I saw Genie at Adobe Live. Yeah. Um, I have feedback, and then that always comes back to us. That's really cool. Yeah. I used to be that person for the mobile apps. I was the person answering the questions. Yeah. So they're real people. Be nice to them. Yeah. Um, Anel's wondering, where can I go with an idea for an app? I don't know how to code it. This is a great way to prototype with XD. Yeah. So with XD, I highly recommend you know just testing things out and being able to say, like, hey, does this flow work? Does this design work? Mm -hmm. um, you can always open a new, like here, on when you select the artboards on the left side, you can actually see on the right side, there's a bunch of artboards that you can pick from. So you yeah. can say, like, here's what an Android mobile would look like. Mm -hmm. I'm going to show it up oh, here. It or you can say, like, iPhone X. Mm -hmm. And you can just, like, put out a bunch of screens um, and, like, design in them and kind of see, like, okay, would my design work? Mm -hmm. Does it make sense in this context that people are using it in? Um, and then for actual development, I so just kind of asking developers or reaching out on the internet to see like are there developers who are interested in working on something similar. Mm -hmm. um, Product Hunt is a great place for that. Oh, cool. Product yeah. Hunt. Yeah, Product cool. Hunt. Um, they, those are, it, those are typically more polished projects, but you can kind of see like what kind of apps really make it big there, and you know, or what kind of like ideas people are looking at for apps. Um, and guide you. You can always reach out to developers there and say like, do you know anyone who's open to working mm -hmm. on an Android app for? Cats, whatever yes, it is that I you're am. looking. I'm not even a developer. I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Yeah, and now so that is a great way to find uh, developers. You could also maybe even post it in your Behance, like looking to develop this. Anybody interested? People are always commenting, appreciating. Yep. I love that aspect of Behance. It's super cool. So we're only going to be here for a couple more minutes. Um, maybe you can do an overview of the project again. Maybe show a couple more things and I'm interested in seeing it. Yeah, so one thing I like to do is I like to show people what it would look like to translate something that you've made in XT and then, mm -hmm. you know, put on the internet in real life to right. a Behance project. Oh, so cool. I have a Behance project here that Love is it. our 10-year 10 10 year anniversary yeah. as a Behance project. And you can kind of see what I'll do is I'll just kind of export the screens mm -hmm. quickly from XT and XT is super good for exporting um, just really in quick. a browse, yeah, mm -hmm. like when, as you're browsing, uh, you can actually select a bunch of the artboards. Cool, yeah. and that's a great way to do that. Yep. Sorry about that, we're gonna have to leave very soon. Scott Belsky is coming on the screen, but thank you, Jeannie, no. for being here. Thank you so much for uh, having me. Check out her Behance profile if you wanna see more. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Wow, it's pretty cool to be back on the stage. 99U started 10 years ago, and uh, the team and what they have done with it just absolutely blows my mind, so I'm honored to be here. Uh, Today, um, I am here to talk about one of my new side fascinations, and um, 
So if you'll indulge me, what is a side fascination? I feel like a side fascination is when you're uh, working on building something and then you kind of become fascinated with a, a dimension of it that is other than the thing you're building and you just start thinking about it and other things come out of that fascination. Like that is a legit side fascination. Uh, for Behance, which was an effort to get uh, the creative world together on a platform to showcase uh, and discover their work uh, and build their careers. The side fascination became what I would summarize as the missing curriculum. All the stuff that you don't learn in design school or don't necessarily learn on the job unless you're attuned to it, that makes such a difference in, uh, in your success as a creative professional. And so that became a side fascination that led to, uh, to my book uh, and also to this conference. Uh, and the team that I gathered that shared this fascination uh, really ran with, um, ran with it. Uh, and so over the years uh, since, you know, eight years of being an entrepreneur and an advisor to entrepreneurs, and then a couple of years within a big company and more recently back in a big company, I've developed a new side fascination about the mysterious middle of journeys that nobody talks about. Um, so allow me to explain. This, I think, is the, uh, is the perceived uh, journey of building something. And when people ask me my quick story, I say, oh, you know, in 2005, um, I, I, along with a few others, had this idea to organize the creative world. And so we got a team together. We took about five years of bootstrapping, two years as a venture-backed company. We built this platform and a bunch of other things, and we got acquired by Adobe, and that's the story. And uh, that, first of all, doesn't tell you anything about what actually happened. Um, and, uh, and it's also not true. I would say that uh, the truth is a little bit more like this. <laughs> it was um, extraordinarily bumpy and, uh, and fits and starts. And I would argue that um, what you're aiming for in the journey is ultimately just for every low to be a little less low and every high to be a little higher. The elusive positive slope is probably the absolute best case scenario that you can have for your project, um, a business that you're starting or a new, uh, a new business that you're building within a bigger company or a career. Uh, I think this is as good as it gets. So the starts and finishes um, get all the fanfare. Everyone loves talking about the moment of conception and everyone loves talking about what happens at the end. And the press especially love starts and finishes. They're so pithy and easy to summarize and ship with a bow. They make great, great headlines, because what can be so easily summed is celebrated. Whether it's a, you know, start, someone leaving and starting a new company, or launching a business, or going IPO, or going bankrupt, it's just so easy to put it together. And what is too dynamic to summarize is so easily overlooked, especially by the press. And so this kind of elusive middle, you know, what I've liked to you know, come to call the messy middle, gets very little coverage. No one really talks much about it because, again, it's just a series of bumps. And, uh, and frankly, we're not necessarily as proud of ourselves in the messy middle because it's ten it, we're never our, our best selves throughout. And, um, and we learn a lot the hard way. Uh, and so over the last five years or so, pursuing this side fascination, I've tried to meet with as many entrepreneurs and artists and writers and others that have endured a very messy middle and um, instead of asking about you know, the classic questions, where did your idea come from? How did you get started? You know, when did it start working? I try to really delve deeply into the, um, the stuff that they'd probably choose to forget that happened in the middle. Uh, and in this pursuit, uh, I, of course, kind of had to think about it for myself as well. Um, what was my middle like? And it was interesting because I, there were about five or six years of my own journey building Behance and, and the company that spawned 99U and uh, the stuff we've done since. And I, um, I couldn't really remember what actually happened in this like, middle five to six year period. It was all such a blur, um, which, which kind of makes me wonder if we're kind of blocking out uh, the stuff that happens in the middle for a reason, again, because we don't necessarily want to bask ourselves in uh, this period of time where we were sort of struggling we don't necessarily want to conjure up these memories. So I figured, OK, if I'm going to really have this side fascination about the middle and even have this idea of writing a book about the messy middle, I better start with my own middle. And so what did I do? What do we do when we have no idea what to do? We just look at our phones, right? <laughs> so I looked at my phone, 
And I went to photos, and I flicked back a lot, right, back to this middle period. And I went to kind of the middle of the middle um, to really look for clues. And, uh, and the first thing that immediately struck me was screenshots. So many screenshots of bugs that I would send to the team, of things that didn't look exactly right. You know, and also, I was struck by the days before the world of responsive web design um, and just kind of clunky UI and whatever. Everything always looks bad in retrospect, right? Um, but uh, what I was re reminded of with this wealth of screenshots throughout so many years was just how I was constantly obsessing and endlessly laboring over every aspect of what we were building. Um, I was always also struck by the time and date stamp of these screenshots. Um, you know, revealed at the top right of the phone. I was like, oh my goodness, you know, some of these were actually middle of the night, early morning, sleepless nights. I could tell I was just grabbing my phone and looking through it. Um, I also saw another type of screenshot. Tons and tons of screenshots of what customers were saying. Um, this was the way I would share feedback with the team with some credibility of the, the fact that customers feel this way. It's not just me. Um, but if I'm honest, there was also another reason for these screenshots. I was trying to capture a form of reward when there was none. I was trying to also capture some of the things people said they were excited about or doing right. And I was using this as a form of non-financial reward for myself and for the team. And uh, you know, almost like if I captured it, it was real and it meant that we were actually making progress. I had lots of screenshots of things that upset me. Um, this is one of our, this is our paper product that we used to kind of bootstrap the company in the early days. And so, gosh, there were so many ugly paper shots of just things that I was sending back to the manufacturer and being like, I mean, if, if, we're, if this is our, how we're building a brand of organizing in the creative world and our, our customers are designers, how can these things look like this? Um, lots and lots of screenshots like that. Screenshots of tons of images chronicling progress and um, breakthroughs as we had them, as if a testament to progress was likely to lead to more of it. I was, for some reason, always kind of capturing that stuff as well. Again, just trying to like, build texture in the journey. And I saw tons of pictures of our beautiful team. Um, a lot of pictures of offsites and meetings and fun times and hard times. And I was reminded of how familial the middle years were. You know, when there was no product to be excited about, we were excited just to be with each other. And that really came through in the pictures. Um, my honeymoon. I saw pictures of uh, my honeymoon, this uh, trek through Cambodia and Thailand. And, um, but I also was, with these pictures, struck with a memory of the constant preoccupation of being away from a team that was three months away from running out of money. And I actually you know, sort of paused during this process and asked myself, I don't know if I was ever truly present while I was there. And I, and I struggled with that because I realized I would never be able to do that again. There was a lot of despondence in these pictures, um, pictures I couldn't necessarily explain. Um, I remember being on some anti-nausea medication at one point in the middle just because, it, it, and I, I don't know, I, I just uh, was nauseous a lot, or nauseated a lot, and uh, I'm not even sure what the spoon shot is all about, but <laughs> it's pretty sad. <laughs> so um, I really, you know, after this kind of journey through the pictures, um, I realized that so much of a successful journey is just sticking together long enough to figure it out. And, uh, and if we boil down the middle of a journey to two things, I think it is endurance is one, enduring the lows, right? And somehow having that resiliency, learning from them, and again, making every low a little less low, and optimization, optimizing the hell out of everything that works, and asking at every high point, why did this work? And then doing more of it. Why did this work for our product, for our team, or the way that we work as leaders? And so that's what I wanted to talk about today, is, um, is this endure and optimize, these two parts of what I believe the messy middle is broken down into, and, uh, and just share some of the thoughts that uh, I came across in my own kind of retrospective, but also uh, in now you know, leading up to a book that I'm publishing in October about the messy middle, a lot of the themes of, again, um, artists, entrepreneurs, writers, people within big companies that are leading turnarounds, talking about their middle, and some of the, um, some of the themes that I heard from, from, this, from this work. And so let's start with Endure. And, um, 
And let's start with uh, this realization that so much of the middle is about accepting the burden of processing uncertainty. And, um, and if you think about it, uh, you know, that is the reality. I would, I would argue to say that um, a chronic condition of creativity is being able or having to manage uncertainty. Uh, how, do you, how do you overcome this? I mean, first of all, you have to remind yourself to focus on things that are in your influence rather than out of your influence. I mean, there's just so much stuff, right, that, is, that you're uncertain about and worried about. And I think one of um, the challenges that a lot of leaders say is one of the most important things they learn is you know, that notion of what is in and out of your circle of influence, and can you always ask yourself uh, that question, and can you really challenge yourself to push your attention towards what is actually in your circle of influence? Compartmentalizing insecurity work is another thing that's important. What is insecurity work? Insecurity work is the stuff you do, oftentimes repeatedly throughout the day, just to reassure yourself that everything is okay, but that doesn't move the ball forward in any way. So this might be looking at Google Analytics to see if anyone came to your website again and again and again, looking at mentions on Twitter for your brand again and again and again, not moving the ball forward, but reassuring you in uncertain times that things are okay. And the amount of time that this eats up and the amount of a hit it takes on productivity is, 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 is real. And preserving some periods of disconnection, um, uh, making sure that you actually have time in this world where we're constantly connected and being reactive to everything that's coming into us, making sure that you preserve some periods in your day to be proactive in what matters most to you. I really feel like now, in some ways, the shower is the final frontier <laughs> of a place where you're not being bombarded by stuff, right? You're not reacting. You don't have all these inboxes around you and whatever else. And, um, but we have to now, it's almost like a competitive advantage in the, in the connected world to be disconnected. Because it's during that time where you actually take a period to sketch and to think and to plan. And so make sure that you now schedule that for yourself because you can no longer rely on circumstance to do it for you. And again, this notion of accepting uncertainty as a chronic condition of creativity is important. So let's see. Uh, another another uh, major point here is, to is, is how to short circuit our own and our team's reward system to get through this period of endurance and all of these lows that are the reality of the messy middle. About 10 years ago, on this stage, we had Fred Wilson, uh, an a, a investor in New York City, talk, and he, um, he, he proclaimed that the two greatest addictions are heroin and a weekly salary. And uh, it was interesting, uh, because, um, because that's kind of true. You know, we're, we're, from the moment we're born, we're conditioned for these short-term rewards of love and affection and approval, and then a check on the test, and a grade in the exam, and then a grade in the course, and then a salary every two weeks, and a bonus at the end of the year. And then when we embark on a bold, ver bold journey um, that is either off the radar within a big company or a new company that has no financial reward and no one even knows what we're doing, we're working in complete anonymity, um, we lose any form of short-term rewards that we are so addicted to. And, uh, and so what we sometimes do is we fool ourselves into thinking that the long-term vision and promise is enough to keep us motivated. It is actually enough to get us to take a risk or to get someone to join us, uh, but then two or three weeks hit, you know, the reality sets in that, oh, you know what, um, I, there's no end in sight, and I'm not really sure where this is going to land. And in those instances, you have to actually short-circuit your reward system in some way. So, we had some fun ways of doing this on Team Behance. Uh, one of them was fun for the team, less so for me. Uh, I'm a vegetarian, lifelong, and my team thought it would be really fun to say, hey, when we had half a million members, which I thought would never happen, I have to eat meat. And, um, and so somehow this was written down and, and, and captured, and literally you know, five years later from this bet that we had, I had to uh, eat a piece of meat off of one of our engineers' forks, which somehow became part of the bargain. Um, the, uh, but I did it. I mean, you know, what else better than, you know, this funny reward that kind of keeps us cracking even though we don't know what will ultimately become of the company. Um, another kind of near, even shorter term, early stage reward was uh, uh, we had a fictional name for our business, Behance, right? We made it up. It didn't mean anything. And so whenever you typed in Behance into Google, it always said, do you mean enhance? Do you mean enhance? And so we were determined to someday no longer be a mistake. 
And, uh, and after you know, a couple years of blog posts and getting more and more designers to put up profiles and portfolio and projects on Behance that are linking back or just press and that sort of thing. Eventually, one day, one person on our team did a search in Behance, uh, in, for a Behance in Google, and it just came up as like Behance. And we were like, oh my goodness. Like, it didn't really mean anything. We didn't, uh, that didn't mean we were suddenly uh, a profitable company. It didn't mean that we had made it, but it was one of those short-term rewards that we were so geared for that just kept us engaged over the near term. And then I kid you not, like a year later, Beyonce became super popular, and we lost it again. <laughs> um, but the point is, is that you have to kind of find ways to short circuit and keep your team engaged when there are no formal rewards in sight. Um, so I've always found that the greatest bouts of progress and most breakthroughs come from those who do work that they do not have to do. Um, for example, you're in a team and you hate the way they do marketing. Are you just gonna complain, or are you the type of person that just puts together a proposal and shops it around and really starts to, to, to lobby for the changes that you believe need to be made? And if you can, you start doing them yourself. Whether it's starting up the social media strategy that no one else is doing, and you're like, you know what? I'm just gonna do this myself. Um, it's so important, and it's fascinating, right? That so much innovation happens out of the work of people that are stepping out of the confines of their role, or out of the lines, so to speak. Um, which goes to say that uh, in this middle period, it's so important to care indiscriminately about the work that needs to get done to make something great. And that was a theme that people talked about in their own careers and in their own projects with their teams. So uh, I remember talking to uh, Alexa Von Tobel, um, a best-selling author, founder of LearnVest, which she ultimately sold for over $300 million to this company called Northwestern Mutual. Um, pioneer in kind of the field of uh, finance for the next generation. And she was talking about a two-week period of fielding acquisition offers, giving birth, and shifting her management team. This all kind of happened at one, you know, out of her control. Everything kind of came into this two-week period. And uh, I was just kind of awestruck by this. I just didn't understand, you know, talk about endurance. Like, how did you work your way through it? And her answer, similar to other people's answers about very difficult periods, is that they were able to somehow just say them to themselves, it's your fucking job, you gotta do this. And, um, and I think you know, that's, that, that, that resonated with me. I think that some of the most difficult decisions that I've had to make over the years, whether it was firing somebody or killing a product or a feature or a program that I really loved, um, breaking bad news, uh, you know, declining an opportunity to someone you really respect, uh, I would struggle or shy away from making it. And, uh, and I learned to sort of, in some ways, oftentimes even say out loud to myself, like, do your fucking job, Scott. And that, that was one of those forcing functions in the middle to stay coarse and to uh, make, make progress. Um, I really think that when you fail to do this, when you fail to make uh, the difficult decisions that need to be made, you are the cause of what I call, what I like to call organizational debt. And organizational debt plagues organizations as they grow. And organizational debt is the collection of tough decisions that were never made. And so you have to constantly be forcing yourself to do this job, right? And especially when it's hard, that's where you kind of have to summon that courage and the realization that if you don't do this, it will, it will pay back in spades in a bad way. Um, and it, it's up to you to do it. Let's talk about resourcefulness versus resources. I mean, who here wishes they had a bigger budget? <laughs> we all do, right? And uh, it's interesting that uh, over the years, as I've met with a lot of creative professionals, and especially in agencies or small agencies, uh, designers, and I would ask them, kind of tell me about a project that went horribly wrong. More often than not, it was a project where the brief was very, very you know, uh, expansive, and the constraints were missing. And they were actually um, missing the limits, right? That would actually, these constraints that would force creativity, would force them to kind of struggle with something. Um, if you think about it, constraints uh, keep us uncomfortable. Um, and, uh, and it's critical because comfort breeds complacency. In some ways, it doesn't push us as much as we need to to have a productive creative process. Uh, thinking more about this, I feel like resourcefulness is like muscle. When you develop resourcefulness, whether it's through 
having no budget and having to make do with what you have or having difficult years you know, in the project that you're leading, uh, it just builds muscle that is, uh, that is gonna always be with you forever and the decisions you make and the things you're trying to make happen. But if resourcefulness is like muscle, resources is carbs. You just kind of burn through it. It's nice, but it doesn't kind of make you better uh, in terms of more swift and agile and powerful you know, as a leader. And so um, it's important to value resourcefulness over resources and to embrace the constraints, right? And if you don't have them, to seek them. So those are some thoughts on the endurance side. And of, uh, I tried to pick some that would be helpful in the, in the small amount of time we have together this morning. Um, the second piece uh, that I figured I'd share some thoughts on is in the, in the, in the, in the section around optimizing. You know, how are you optimizing what works? And, uh, and this starts with investing in both your product and your organization in equal parts. It's so interesting. We often seek customer feedback. We're obsessed with iterating and improving our products and our services but we tend to underinvest in our team. We will A-B test to the wazoo the product that we have in the world, but we won't A-B test the way we work. We won't say, hey, you know, for the next two weeks, let's no longer meet Tuesday morning just because it's Tuesday, and then let's determine whether that was more productive or less productive, and if it's worse, revert to the previous version, and if it's great, adopt it and do another test. We don't debrief what's really gone wrong, typically. We just fix it. And we very seldom debrief what went right so we could actually learn what is so reproducible and important to preserve for the next time we do something. Um, and so it's, a, it's, it's an interesting um, dilemma. Like, how do you make sure that you're investing in equal parts? I'm remembering uh, the first year that I was working with Ben Silberman, who is the founder of Pinterest. And, uh, and I, was, I remember checking in with him like six or seven months after he started the he pivoted the previous version of his company into Pinterest. And I asked him kind of, what's your roadmap for the next year? I was just curious what he was planning on doing. And I was expecting to hear a, a list of features that might hit the site um, or you know, major product objectives. But instead, he just looked at me and said, my only focus for the next six to 12 months is to uh, improve our processes. And I just was curious about that, because first of all, it seemed like the wrong objective for a startup. But he just had this vision from the very beginning that he was building a team and culture that would withstand all the ups and downs of the product. And he was so invested in that from the onset. And that always really stuck with me. A lot of, uh, let's talk about ROI uh, you know, versus impact and the pursuit of quick wins sometimes getting in the way of long-term potential. It's really interesting how we have this tendency towards dopamine hits. And we wanna just make progress. We wanna feel like we are solving problems. And so as a result, um, sometimes we've, and we've probably all seen this, where you're on an email chain debating you know, where a logo's positioned or uh, some very small minutia piece of a product when there's some glaring big elephant in the room problem that no one is talking about. And it's like, why are we, why are we spending so much time on these little nuances when, uh, when there are bigger problems that we have to actually tackle? And, um, and so the thought here is making sure that as we're optimizing our product and our teams, we are also kind of always anchoring ourselves with one of those big, audacious problems and that we are being annoying about it in a context of a team that by default, we'll probably want small and quick wins because that's just innately you know, the way we're wired as human beings. Um, and uh, don't ever let those, you know, that pursuit of small problems being solved get in the way of the one or two big problems that you would solve that no one else can, right? That will ultimately differentiate your product, your team, your process, how you work. Uh, my criteria over the years for, um, for hiring or investing in a team has evolved. And I would say that um, now it really comes down to this desire to work with people with whom discussions evolve by a step function. We all meet people all the time, and a lot of people's conversations with you may feel like repeats. And every time you check in, it's like, hey, what's up? How are you doing? Talk about the same sort of thing, the same, even people on your team, the same sort of problem. And then there are some people that have this ability to always build upon the conversation, right? Every, pro every conversation you have seems insatiably more interesting. And I think some of those people are the people that make the greatest partners in business um, and projects and creative projects and endeavors. Um, and when you optimize your team of these kind of builders as opposed to repeaters, it is, you're constantly gonna be changing the way that you work 
and the product that's out there. It's just the nature of the chemistry of a team with people like that. And so I think it's a good litmus test when you're interviewing people and, 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 or, uh, or building relationships with people you want to work with over time is, is, we is whether or not conversations are becoming more interesting by a step function whenever you have them. Um, let's talk about innovation for a moment. I feel like uh, when you're innovating uh, in, in, the, in that middle and you're trying to find some distinguishing elements that will really you know, make your product or business or project success a success, uh, innovation is ultimately, uh, an innovation is an edge that becomes a center, right? And, and the thing about edges is that they look weird. Uh, take Airbnb, the classic example where, you know, someone sleeping in your bed seems so weird to all the investors that met with that team and they couldn't raise any money until they found someone who was willing to kind of familiarize themselves with this very seemingly unreasonable idea. Uh, reasonable thinking really very much keeps us where we've been. And the funny thing about hiring a team is that we typically try to hire people that we feel are reasonable. You know, that dangerous term, culture fit, which is really a, a term or, uh, for people that are like me, that I feel like I can think similarly to. It's a dangerous thing because then you ultimately build a team around you that is thinking just like you. And, um, and it's really at the edge of reason. When someone says something that strikes you as unreasonable, but then you have so much respect for them, and you're curious about their perspective, and then through ongoing discussion, it becomes more familiar, and then you become open to it, and then suddenly it becomes something that the rest of the world says was an obvious step, a major innovation that seems obvious to the rest of us, like all great innovations end up feeling. Uh, and so what is the shortcut? To stack, to stack your team, you know, stack the deck in, favor, in your favor or increase your odds, it's simply diversity. It is building a team of people um, that are extraordinarily different, extraordinary people. And making sure that, uh, and it's not just biological checkboxes, and it's, it's just people that have so many different backgrounds, have such a different surface area um, of experience that they're pulling from. Those are the folks that are uh, in collectively more likely to be thinking in an unreasonable way from each other. Everyone's sort of on a different uh, level of, of where their perspective is. And those clashes of difference end up re revealing these edges that then become the center and that keep your innovation uh, fuel there. And so it's super important to build a chemistry that drives that. Um, this diversity sustains the differentiation of whatever your product or service or talent is in your team. Um, but how do you give these unreasonable chance, uh, insights a chance at succeeding, at, at really ap actually happening? Because it's one thing to have a great idea like that at the edge, but it's another thing to convince the whole team to pursue it. And actually, if you always rely upon convincing everyone uh, and reaching this sense of consensus, which is such a safe and, way, a safe and reliable way to keep everyone happy, uh, you will never have that um, you'll never have a chance of really, like, really concretely executing an innovation because, again, there will always be some people who don't really get it. And so that notion of valuing conviction over consensus, having a team chemistry where if someone that you really respect who's an expert in their field pounds the table and says, I believe in this, you know, do you have a culture where then everyone rallies behind that person? And if you talk to, again, a lot of groups of investors, um, they'll talk about some of their greatest investments being situations where there wasn't consensus about making that investment, but there was conviction. You hear the same thing about major product breakthroughs in, within companies. People were very doubtful, but there was one person positioned the right way with the right credibility who just pounded the table. Uh, and so it's, uh, it's important to remember that these greatest breakthroughs come from non-obvious insights. And these you know, reasonable minds will not engage very quickly. You have to you have to have that conviction and value it and empower it. When we, when we are building products, when we are building products, one of the most common challenges that I see in startups is that they are, um, that they are founded by people who are deeply passionate about a solution to a problem, but aren't necessarily empathetic with the customers suffering from that problem. And so with passion, we gather a team, and we, we sell our story and everything else. And then we end up realizing a couple years from now that, wait, you know, we actually didn't really understand the friction that we were trying to solve. And, uh, and so the challenge for us as we build products within companies or start our own companies is to 
make sure we're anchoring ourselves with empathy you know, for the customers. You can never spend enough time, right? You can never spend enough time with the customers making sure and rechecking uh, and, and re, re, recalibrating that empathy with what the problem is you're trying to solve. And it's a challenge for all of us because we're creative people and we get fired up by our passion for something we see uh, and that actually can end up being a hindrance uh, and we have to make sure that empathy is constantly anchoring us. Let's talk about opportunities. Uh, so I get asked a lot by friends about job offers and opportunities that they're pursuing. And it's interesting that so many career decisions are made at face value. The name of the company, the reputation that company currently has at this very moment, which of course, as we know, is liable to change at any moment. Everyone's kind of trying to join something hot. And they forget that great careers are made by joining something cold and making it hot. Uh, it's, uh, it, and so what I advise people to do is to focus more on when they're deciding in opportunities, uh, even within, you know, within a company, a new, new vector of innovation you're gonna pursue or a job you're gonna take or a client you're gonna choose to work with versus not choose to work with. So to, to focus on where the learning curve will be steepest. And, um, and also always having that edict, right? That you want to join a team not just for what it is, for what for, for, but for what you believe that you can make it become. Um, and that requires uh, a good sense of the value you bring. And when you're looking at an opportunity, don't just look for something where you think that it will look great on a business card, it will be a good headline, and you'll be proud to tell your friends. Look for a hole that you feel you can fill. I mean, really look for something in a company or in a client where you're like, I'm the perfect person for that. And I really believe, and I've seen so many examples of this, especially writing this book, um, of people who, you know, that was their main criteria. And at first, people may have said to them, why are you taking that opportunity that doesn't seem um, so hot? And they're like, you know what, because it's perfect for me. And then they made it into something even, even grander. Um, the last piece I would just say on this optimize area is, uh, is how many people I met with who, you know, would talk about the major inflections in, in their careers and their projects where they really knew that they were onto something. And you know, I, I've told this story before about someone I knew in the publishing industry who uh, many years ago was asked to take a job um, running the digital publishing group in the company. And people said to him, like, why would you ever take uh, a job in digital publishing? No one's ever gonna read a book on a computer. You know, people just doubted this decision. And for whatever reason, the more doubt he got, the more confident he became that this was in fact um, the best opportunity because he suddenly had this conviction of where the industry was going. Which goes to say that if everyone thinks you're crazy, you're either crazy or you're really onto something. <laughs> and, and so it's, it's, it's something to always keep in mind, detecting the difference between cynicism and criticism, learning to gain confidence from the doubt you get when you're about to make a major decision in a project or in your life. Because sometimes that is a cue that you're onto the right path because nothing extraordinary is ever achieved through ordinary means. The final mile. Well, the final mile of a big project or a bold venture, new company, is an entirely different sport. And in the book I talk about, um, uh, in this new book I talk about all the examples of people screwing up, thrashing, or self-sabotaging themselves in the, in the final mile. Because it's really, it's a different playbook altogether. You know, all the stuff you've done in the messy middle to endure and to optimize, suddenly there is an end in sight. People start to act differently, think differently, egos change. There's so much that happens that, uh, and, and we're not equipped even though we actually think we are, because we got ourselves there. And so it's an interesting conundrum where suddenly um, you're not necessarily outfitted to make the decisions uh, with the confidence that you've had throughout the journey. Um, one of the big, big uh, tricks with the final mile is to always keep your mind and stay in the early innings. I was struck when I was walking around uh, Facebook a couple years ago and there were all these stickers on uh, computers around the company that said, we're 1% uh, into the journey. Um, and uh, it was just an interesting mantra, this notion of, hey, we're still 1% in, we're still 1% in. I mean, what is the early inning, what are the early innings like? You know, you're still taking risks, 
You're still willing to make mistakes. The product is just finding itself and just finding its stride. You're still falling asleep and waking up with new ideas. You're thinking about all these little small tweaks that can make a big difference. In the early innings, you're always selling. You're always, always selling. Everyone you meet is a potential supporter, investor, employee, you know, prospective customer. These, it's, 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 it, but this is not temporal. It's a mentality. Some people are able to stay in the early innings, regardless of where they are, and some people are not. Your challenge is to make sure that wherever you are, you're always in the early innings. You also need to remember, as things start to work for you, that uh, you, you can't start taking credit. You also can't start really giving credit to specific people. It's a, it's, a, it's a bad tendency because as soon as you start to divvy out credit, you're actually kind of lessening the collective sense of ownership and openness and, the, and thus willingness to execute. In some ways, credit for one depletes the ownership by many. And, um, and so I, I always you know, like to remind myself that influence is very much most effective without seeking attribution. You will be more influential uh, with your ideas, especially later on in your journey, if you keep reminding yourself that it wasn't you um, that did it. Finally, uh, it's very important to stay engaged. And uh, I'm always reminded of that Umberto Eco, that Italian uh, philosopher and novelist, his, uh, his, his mantra that to be done is to die. And which is why I'm always throwing massive amounts of stuff in my to-do list, because I don't want don't to die. Um, but I really believe that curiosity is what keeps us from feeling finished. Uh, as soon as you start to have a success in your career or in a project, uh, it's easy to bask in it. And um, I always also like to remind myself that the, the risk of getting attention is that you stop paying attention. And so curiosity can overcome this. If you have this insatiable curiosity about the topic you're playing in, um, it can keep you from starting to tune out. I also think about this a lot these days in this world we're living in, where um, it's so easy to become apathetic to the news. We become numb. And it's like, where does you know, civic engagement really lead us. And in fact, that's of course the opposite thing we should be thinking. And the people that I admire that are actually getting more civically engaged, they're doing it through curiosity. They're trying to just understand what's going on. Um, they're trying to stay in the game you know, as a citizen. And so I think we need to do this not only in our projects, but in this crazy world we're living in. Um, it will make sure that we, uh, we keep evolving and, and keep changing. And so with that, uh, I want to thank you for having me today. And welcome back here at Adobe Live, live from New York City from the 99U conference in its 10th anniversary. And for the next 20 minutes, <laughs> I'm here with Rumiana Williams. Uh, she's a product designer based in New York City and she currently works for Adobe. So we have a lot of stories to, uh, to discover with uh, Rumiana. We will not have time to look at uh, portfolios during this slot, but please continue submitting them because we will be looking at them uh, in the slot right after us. So, Rumiana, tell us a little bit about you and uh, who are you? <laughs> Hi, um, so I'm a, currently a senior experience design lead at Adobe and I've been with the company for a little over four years. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess four and a half. Oh, what's happening down there? Oh, battery changed, but can, can, can we hear? Can we hear Rumiana? We can't hear Rumiana. Okay. All right. <laughs> you know what? Use mine. Yeah. No, no, I got it. Okay. He's got it. Okay. Oh. <laughs> the okay, joys of going you. live. Cool. All right. Hello, Simon. Hello, Let's Anna. Let's try to do it again. Jan Eric is here. Shauna, Tima. Hi. Hi, everybody in the chat. If you have questions for Rum, uh, Rumiana, please don't hesitate to ask them. So, so let's you got start interrupted over. by okay. some technical glitch, but you know it that happens. happens. Uh, so I'm currently a senior experience design lead at Adobe, and I've been here for a little over four years. Mm -hmm. um, I recently switched teams, I guess, a year and a half ago, and currently I'm working on something I can't talk about. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> 
but hopefully you'll see it um, mm -hmm. soon. Mm -hmm. So uh, what I can talk about today is a little bit about older work that mm -hmm. I've done and uh, hopefully some tips and tricks that could help when looking with for a job with, yeah. with portfolios. Okay. Yeah. So, um, uh, um, Rumiana, this is your website, uh, rumianawilliams.com. Yes. Okay. If some, uh, if Tim can put it in the in the in the chat, mm -hmm. maybe yeah. Let's talk a little bit about the, the projects that you wanted to show us here. And, yeah. Uh, let's yeah, go over those. Sure. Sure. So, as I mentioned, maybe I'll talk a little bit more about my background. Mm -hmm. um, so, I've been at Adobe for a little over four years, but before that, I was at RGA. Um, and over there, I worked on um, Nike for two years. And okay. before that, I was there for about two years working across different accounts. So it's interesting because I've always sort of been allocated to one account for a long time. So uh -huh. I kind of live with a project for a long time versus mm -hmm. if you're a freelancer, you go in and you do something quick and then move on to the mm -hmm. next thing. Yeah. Um, so with Adobe, uh, I guess the only font I know now is Adobe Clean. <laughs> Adobe Clean, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's our uh, cor corporate font. Yep. Yep. Um, but um, at Adobe, we focus um, not so. I mean, we do focus on how things look, but we do focus a lot on how things work. Um, and we have a centralized team that helps us with what things look like mm -hmm. and tone of voice and. Uh, having a consistent place where we have interactions and um, gestures and things like uh, shortcuts. Um, so I've throughout my whole time here, I've been working on mobile projects. Mm -hmm. So mostly iOS, some Android. Um, and now I'm working sort of on a cross platform team. Mm -hmm. But my focus has been iOS mostly. Okay. Uh, so the first project that I can talk about, should we jump in? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. This one here? So yeah. Just click on it? Yes. Okay. So this was a project that was done actually, I was on this project in 2015, probably. This was released then. Um, it's the Creative Cloud app. Uh, it currently exists in the App Store, so you can download it. It's free. Mm -hmm. um, as well as our other mobile apps. Um, and this was one of the first iterations. So some things might look a little bit outdated. Hopefully not. Everything's flat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, the purpose of this is very simple. It's a, it's a file management system for um, work that you might have in Creative Cloud. So this is not only files, but this is mostly about your library. So if anyone's using libraries in Photoshop, those are your colors, mm -hmm. your typefaces, um, your um, any kind of brand images. So you could have a library of assets that are only for this brand, and you can share it with team members. Mm -hmm. um, so the focus on this was a lot of collaboration. Okay. Yes. Now, if you don't have the app installed, please download it. I mean, there's even a download button here. Yeah. Download app. Yeah. <laughs> and we have good reviews good. in the app mm -hmm. store. And uh, <laughs> and it, it it can come in very very handy. Um, just, you know, just to check on your assets, to check on your libraries, um, mm -hmm. and also now that they're that the libraries are so tightly integrated with uh, yes. Photoshop Sketch and Illustrator Draw, yeah. um, all of these things really start working together. If, uh, really well and yeah. uh, you know the ecosystem we were always talking about is happening you know? actually that was the other thing I was going to talk about so mm -hmm. this app was not designed in isolation um, mm -hmm. we work I mean I work in a large company we have multiple apps and we work together as design teams um, we have the whole ecosystem of mobile apps and this is to support them mm -hmm. so um, I think at the bottom I actually have links to all of the other ones, but we might have to go back yeah. to talk about details on these. Uh, so and, that, and that's also a nice example. That, that that's actually a PSD with with its preview. So yes. you know you can preview things uh, right yeah. right through the app. And I, yeah, at some point. Oh, uh, and Eric Snowden is actually giving you feedback <laughs> these here. These are old <laughs> comps. <laughs> he was my boss <laughs> at the time. Um, yeah, so. Commenting mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. a huge part of this. Annotations was something that we did in like version two maybe of this app. 
and it was released for um, part of the assets first. I actually don't know if now they have it on all the assets. Uh, there's a new, there's a different designer who's working on this currently. Uh, but the point is that you can actually mark on the image, so you can comment on the mm -hmm. whole asset and then mark on it and uh, write notes for specific mm -hmm. part. So it's mm -hmm. it's actually targeting a workflow between design peers or mm -hmm. designer, creative director, uh, or client, mm -hmm. because feedback is what we we live on, right? Absolutely. And this is also something that was introduced um, into, in Adobe XD, for example, yes. where you can like you know review yes. things and annotate things. Yeah, the web version is fantastic. We oh, use we it go. all the mm -hmm. time. Yeah, so this mm -hmm. is the one. This was done, yeah, about 2015, probably. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so yeah, here are the mobile okay. apps. So we have Sketch and Draw, which are drawing apps. The first one is a pixel-based drawing. The second one is vector-based, so you can actually drawing vectors, fantastic stuff. Mm -hmm. um, Capture, um, it's one of my favorite apps. Um, it's getting better it every, every cycle, yeah. You can, you can create your own brushes, your color palettes, um, actually recognizes typefaces. Mm -hmm. It's super handy and it supports uh, a workflow. I mean, for all of these, they were meant to support a workflow. Mm -hmm. um, they were all designed before the Apple Pencil actually was mm -hmm. out, so mm -hmm. I think the focus was a little different, and they were mm -hmm. supposed to be simpler. It was simpler. like finger painting, yeah. I know. <laughs> but or now, basic stylus painting, yes. yeah. Mm -hmm. So now they might seem a little limited at this time, but we're we're working. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah. So here's the link to all of them, uh, mm -hmm. all of the mobile apps. Um, and yes, Capture CC is, is incredibly um, useful to capture colors, to capture textures, to capture even uh, texture for 3D objects now. Um, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I don't even have the list in my head. There's uh, looks, brushes, oh, yeah, lots, colors. Lots for video, right? Yes, and, looks for video. Uh, yeah. Oh, there's also, so if you haven't used um, Adobe Dimension, mm -hmm. uh, there is um, a materials the, capturing. Mm -hmm. So you could actually go around town, capture mm -hmm. a bunch of materials, and mm -hmm. then go to your desktop and use them in a, in a real project. Mm -hmm. And all of these are super easy to use with our desktop apps. It's usually a type, I mean, a tap of a button. So yeah, open in Photoshop or open yeah. in Illustrator. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. But there's also, um, we have users who are actually using these for professional work, mm -hmm. which is fantastic, especially great. for drawing apps. So we have to thank Rumiana for the design on these. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Shall I go back? Uh, sure. Yeah, so the other one, this is kind of part of it, is mm -hmm. the Apple Watch app. Mm -hmm. So this was also, I mean, an mm. older piece. And it was designed right before the Apple Watch actually launched. So all the assumptions were made on mm -hmm. working with a platform that no one owned. Uh, we got to test it for a day, uh, which kind of shattered a lot of the assumptions. And um, it changed a lot, mm -hmm. I think. And after we released the first version and I got to have an Apple Watch, I realized that a lot of my assumptions were completely wrong mm -hmm. because, I mean, you don't have the time to read and do all of these things. Mm -hmm. It's just about things that you need to do right away. And um, yeah, we cut a lot of it. It's, we don't support it anymore, I think, because priorities shifted, but it was kind of a fun project to do. It was very quick. Um, it's also a very special format, right? Yes. Like this little yes. square format, it's like difficult to, to work with, yeah. I guess. Yeah, and I think as designers, it's always very in exciting to work on something new. I mean, mm -hmm. that's one of my favorite things to do. <laughs> um, yeah, so we don't have it in the App Store anymore, but you can read a little bit more about it. Yeah, I remember it. I loved having a little Creative Cloud icon on my Apple Watch. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. What oh, was, yes, what, I did it in 2014. What was the little heartbeat thing here? Uh, it was Activity. Ah, okay. Which is, it's a tricky icon. Mm -hmm. I don't think it was the right metaphor, so, <laughs> yeah. Cool. I think like I mean this I think is very common for everyone. You look back on work and you're like, oh, what was I thinking? I don't know. <laughs> oh well, it was you know t <laughs> times are changing so quickly yes. that this probably made sense mm -hmm. when you made it. <laughs> yes, it did. And 
I can talk about, maybe scroll down to the next one. Yes. So as I mentioned, uh, before I came to Adobe, I worked at an agency and and in agencies generally designers have different roles. Mm -hmm. So mine, here I'm doing everything. So I'm, I'm taking care of the whole experience. So I do both UI and UX. Mm -hmm. uh, I think more focus on the UX and actually doing, sometimes we do our own research. Mm -hmm. uh, we do a lot of the planning and uh, help with roadmap, et cetera. But when you work in an agency, you have a more narrow role. So mine was visual designer. Mm -hmm. There was a separation between visual design and experience design. And I think in a lot of agencies, they still do that. Um, I was never quite happy with that. I always wanted to do everything, but uh -huh, that's uh -huh. not possible. In especially, an agency, no. <laughs> not, yes, especially when you, when you work on a huge project. Mm -hmm. So this was the redesign of Nike.com. Obviously, it's huge. I worked on it very, very big team. This work was done in 2012, so that's why all the buttons have gradients. <laughs> and there's lots of drop shadows. This is, this is something that I always talk about um, uh, in, in your portfolios. Always make sure to have like, some textual information that actually guides the viewer through you know, what mm -hmm. the different things actually are. Um, there's still too many portfolios that only have images. And it's really hard to understand, you know, what it what it is about, what the thought process was, what the what the, what the ideas behind the things were. So it's very useful to have like a, a header with some Something. information here. Yeah, and to kind of add to this, I think it, there's a different uh, setting for mm -hmm. your portfolio. So like the Behance portfolio is a glance into your mm -hmm. work because there's so many other users. You're trying to impress with your thumbnail and then people might not scroll to the bottom, which mm -hmm. is unfortunate, mm -hmm. but you need to kind of get their attention in right the beginning. Mm -hmm. For your website, then you can go a little more detail. I always tend to write too much mm -hmm. and I have to really step back and say, no, I can't do that because no one's going to scroll to the bottom. They're not here to read a novel. Mm -hmm. And then I think the third part is when you go into um, an actual portfolio review um, at an interview. And mm -hmm. I can talk a, a little bit about what we do mm -hmm. uh, because we interview Adobe a lot of- At Adobe or at Adobe. the agency before? No, okay, at Adobe. Adobe. Okay. Um, because because you do interview people who, yes. who want to, to become yes. like you, designed for Adobe. Yeah. So. We have, um, our process is, is good because we, we make sure that our candidates are fitting the right criteria, but they're also diverse and they bring different points of view. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, we would bring in a candidate after we've kind of seen their portfolio, we've had a conversation with them, and they would come in for half a day. So they would do a portfolio review with um, a lot of designers. Mm -hmm. They would talk to product managers, engineers, uh, the whole team, basically. Does the portfolio review, is, is this mostly digital these days? Or yes. do they still come with a little no. portfolio? And we also, I mean, we only work on digital products. Yeah, yeah. I don't, mm -hmm. I can't even print <laughs> Well, you my could computer. print the screens. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we, we do have um, candidates come in with their portfolio. And I would say the most successful interviews mm -hmm. have been the ones where we have candidates with their, with a presentation. So mm -hmm. it's very focused. They go deep into two projects mm -hmm. and actually tell us like, what is the project about? Mm -hmm. What are the goals? Yeah. What their role was? Mm -hmm. I think that's very, very important. And There's also, actually a question about that. How do you break into the UI UX field? Do you need to know um, to code or the apps or things like that? So, um, you know, to answer that question, part of it just came um, uh, from Rumiana is that uh, you need focus. You really need to. Um, uh, don't show gazillion things that you know yes. that that don't matter. Um, focus on two or three things that you, you think are really successful, um, and that will help you get into this interview. And yeah. uh, forget everything else. You know, everybody's done a gazillion things in their life. But, yes. You know, then it comes down to the two important ones that you want to um, yes. to talk about. And you want to show depth because mm -hmm. we want to see how you think. It mm -hmm. doesn't really matter. How, what the, I mean, the process is very important, mm -hmm. but I think it's kind of secondary because mm -hmm. in school they teach you like what's the proper process for UX, but I think when you go to a job, sometimes it's messy and mm -hmm. it's not quite that perfect, mm -hmm. uh, especially when you work in-house and I think we're very collaborative with our engineering teams and things change on the fly, mm -hmm. so it could get messy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you need to be able to react and like we want to see how you think, mm -hmm. uh, what, how you deal with challenges. Mm -hmm. I think 
that's a very important one mm -hmm. when you come in and you want to talk about what went wrong and mm. if you were in charge what would be different and you know that's also different like uh, you mentioned that okay now you're in like an in-house designer mm -hmm. or an agency designer yes. right they, this is completely different types it's of roles very as well. different mm. different challenges mm -hmm. too yeah, yeah, yeah. yes mm. and i think i mean in a lot of the jobs we we all have to think mm -hmm. on our feet and we have to move quickly mm -hmm. but i think it's a different mindset mm -hmm. a lot of times mm -hmm. uh, because our outputs are different yeah and the uh, requests are different yes. as well. Yeah, mm -hmm. and one thing is that for an agency, I mean, I only have one project that I did a V2 for. Like, the, there's no V2, uh, okay. version uh, no, two. Uh, no version two. Okay. It doesn't yeah, yeah. come back uh -huh. usually uh -huh. to, yeah. to you unless you are really ingrained in that, on that brand and there is a second uh, version, but for us, we live and breathe the product. Mm -hmm. So we go through iterations, we launch, however, many times a year, mm -hmm. and we're always thinking of what's next. Mm -hmm. And the, the difficult thing also with the designing experiences for, for a software, just like the Creative Cloud, for example, is that you have to be very mindful of, um, of the users, like, you know, like removing a function or removing a button. Yes. Uh, this is something that has to go through a lot of thinking because, you know, yes. it's, we might think, okay, not many people use it, let's just yeah. remove it, but then there's, you know, there's, some workflows that are built on it, so it's getting really, really complex. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Tiago is asking, how, how do you integrate your knowledge from graphic design to UX and UI design? Well, um, it always helps mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> to be able to, to You're be able a graphic to do, design major, right? Yes, mm -hmm. I, I came from a graphic design background, so I learned how to design books and magazines and logos mm -hmm. and posters, and I think that was fantastic. I did four, ty four parts typography, I learned all the basics, but even from early on, I knew that I wanted to go into interactive, mm -hmm. and I started prototyping in action script. Mm -hmm. I wanted things to move. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so it's helpful to to be able to mm -hmm. actually have that mm -hmm. sensibility. I think nowadays I actually end up doing more wireframey type of mm -hmm. designs mm -hmm. than um, the actual mm -hmm. UI, but I can do it. Yeah. Yes, it's very helpful. I think it gives you that sensibility, and we're always looking for designers who possess both. Mm -hmm. Well, Sarah is asking, uh, does, does Adobe hire designers outside of the U.S., for example, Canada? Um, well, uh, you never know. You, know, you never know, you, you, yes. You should really, if, if you're interested in working for Adobe, you should really check your, uh, the Adobe Careers website um, and, and look for designer jobs. Um, mm -hmm. you know, not, it's not necessarily U.S.-based. Um, I think there is the we have, design. We have teams in, other, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, we have teams in Germany, mm -hmm. uh, India. Where else do we have teams? I all think over. all over. <laughs> we have Design Week coming up in uh -huh. uh, July, and I think there was a huge list of uh, where mm -hmm. all the designers mm -hmm. are. Yeah, and, and there's many different parts of Adobe. Yes. There's also, um, uh, you know, Adobe Stock. There's designers mm, for Adobe yes. Stock, ad uh, designers for Typekit, designers, you know, for all sorts of different things at, at Adobe. Yes, um, Document Cloud and Marketing Cloud. I think I that's always something forget about those. We <laughs> always do because we're only thinking Creative Cloud, but they have yeah, yeah. a lot uh, yeah. of roles. Mm -hmm. And uh, in, just to say that in New York we have the largest team that's outside of San Francisco design team. I think we have 20 or 21 designers now. Uh, so it's fantastic. I think a lot of people don't know that we have a team in New York. Mm -hmm. They're yeah. always uh, like, oh, we have a, an office? Yes, yeah. oh. we do. <laughs> All right. So is, is there anything more that you want to say about this, uh, the Nike project here? No, I think, I mean, this is just a visual teaser. Um, mm -hmm. I probably, I just want to say that this was done on a huge team. Mm -hmm. And I want to like say how big? very big. There are multiple visual designers, mm -hmm. multiple experienced designers, multiple producers, mm -hmm. multiple creative directors, mm -hmm. huge team. And a lot Which of this work- adds complexity to the project. We right? were all working, sitting next to each other and like throwing files at mm -hmm. each other all the time. So a lot of people have touched the same work. I think it's different ownership. Mm -hmm. But I want to say one very important thing is always, always list who worked on projects because always list? who worked on ah, a project yes. mm -hmm. and like tell the names of your team mm -hmm. and like give them a shout, shout out because mm -hmm. I think that's yeah, the yeah, most yeah, important yeah. Mm -hmm. part of being proud of your work is actually being proud of being part of a team. Yeah, that's right. So yeah, teamwork is, is uh, I see, you know, how, I heard something about that uh, recently that was really cool. It's like, um, if, if you stop caring about ownership, that's when the product becomes successful, you know? Like, because yes. you, 
you yeah you share the ownership with uh, with other people and in, in a case like this with is this huge team it's just a team you know it's not Rumania Ru, Rumiana anymore it's uh, it's, yes, it's the absolutely. team so now that it's all smaller is it uh, is it a little bit different to work I work on a smaller team mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we're, we're just two designers, mm -hmm. soon to be three, uh, on one product, but we work across the ecosystem of mm -hmm. Adobe products, mm -hmm. so we're actually working on a large team. Mm -hmm. And um, the most important part is that the product is not influenced only by us, but mm -hmm. we work with product managers and engineering. Mm -hmm. So the trio is actually creating the mm -hmm. product, and we have researchers and strategists. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, prototypers. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of influence by mm -hmm. various places. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So just to wrap it up, what? <laughs> okay, one minute. One minute? Oh yes, oh we're done. Oh, Rumiana, thank you so much for, you. for joining us. Thank and you. I think the, the, the most important tip here is focus when you show your portfolio, show, focus on a couple of things that are really important for the job and for you and forget all of the rest. We'll be right back in five minutes with, uh, with Adobe Live, so stay tuned and uh, thank you, Rumiana. Thank you. <laughs>